So hello everyone. Uh, on behalf of URL, so it's a special pleasure again to welcome you to the latest edition of the URLs of webinar series. And uh, today we have a, a sort of a novum because as you realize over the last, last months, ever since we started this exciting series, we talked about new literature, we talked about guidelines, we call, talked about best practice. And today we have a specialist with us who will share his experience on something where we don't really have so much data on. And it's really, really a great pleasure to welcome today Robert Loveridge uh, from uh, King's College in, in the UK. Uh, Robert is not only a biological anthropologist, but also a medical doctor uh, with a dual certification in intensive care and anesthesia. And he is the consultant running the intensive care unit of the liver uh, department at the King's College. Uh, all of you know it's a renowned uh, a department worldwide uh, specialized in liver transplant and he's also the co-director of the local ECMO program and uh, Robert thank you so much for joining today and for putting all the effort in into your time now before we start I would like to address our participants um, if this is the first time you're joining today uh, the rough schedule is that in the first half of the webinar, we will have the chance to listen to Robert and his presentation. And even uh, already during the presentation, you as participants will have the chance to uh, enter in your questions in the webinar tool um, on the side of your screen. You will pass on the questions to me and then I will facilitate the moderation in the second half and uh, we will have some fruitful discussion. So please join and um, really ask everything that you would like to know in this uh, very exciting topic. So Rob, it's a pleasure to have you and I kindly ask you to give us your uh, welcome presentation. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me to talk today. Um, it's my first webinar, so it's a very exciting opportunity. I'm not used to the high tech that you've offered here, and you and Victoria have been brilliant. So thank you. So what I'm going to uh, do is just uh, talk to you about ECMO in the setting of liver failure and liver transplantation. And, and I've added a little caption at the front because we are talking about patients for whom conventional medicine has uh, run out of options and for whom we are uh, thinking of offering extracorporeal support. Uh, I've got a, a few uh, comments to make. I, I, first of all, I've got no financial disclosures, um, uh, but I've got a lot of thanks to give. So uh, a thank you to everybody who works on the service at King's. This would not be possible without them. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Elton and Lisa, who are ECMO coordinators who keep the whole program running. Um, thank you to George Asinger. He is very much the visionary and uh, has been the clinical director, both for critical care and for liver intensive care, again, without which uh, we, we could not have done all this. And thanks very much to my colleague, um, uh, Sam Patel, who has kept the ball rolling and always thought of the patients first. So what am I going to talk about? Uh, a few key facts, really. Uh, I'm not trying to sell you something, but uh, some key facts about survival, particularly in acute liver failure. And then a, a little bit on, is there any literature on ECMO and liver failure and transplantation? And then I'm gonna show you some of our data and talk about what does the future hold and let you answer the question. Uh, because I think this is about everybody coming together to think about the patients with different pathologies because we know that this is a new and evolving technology. So, Acute liver failure, that, that is the triad of encephalopathy, of jaundice, of coagulopathy. And it is a de novo disease. This is not something we're talking about in chronic disease. Uh, it is rare and it is predominantly fatal disease. Uh, and it has been revolutionized uh, by liver transplantation. Uh, for those who meet criteria but do not get transplanted, uh, survival is extremely poor uh, and therefore the question as to when is someone too sick to transplant uh, arises for some of our patients 
And uh, although medical management has approved, particularly for paracetamol uh, overdose, and survival may be as high as 24% without transplantation in those who meet poor prognostic criteria. And nonetheless, uh, this is a very dangerous disease if you are the patient. We've been doing transplantation at King's for a long time, and this is data from NHS uh, BT, who are in charge of the transplant services. Uh, and you can see uh, at the top, uh, King's and Birmingham both doing uh, the largest volume of liver transplants in the UK and both with good outcomes. Um, and here for emergency liver transplantation, again, uh, looking at uh, the six transplant uh, centers and again, looking at outcomes here. And, and why do I show you this? Because it is important to understand that in these diseases, uh, liver transplantation is life-saving with one year survivals up at 90%. And when you compare that to uh, certain death for those that meet criteria without transplant, you can understand the importance of getting to transplant and the importance of surviving after the transplant. So, so where does ECMO fit in and is there anything in the literature to guide us? Uh, I think the truth is there is very little. There, there are some excellent case series. Uh, so Park et al and Sayer et al uh, have published a series of uh, 18, 32, and then 44 cases. Uh, there are case reports uh, from across the world, uh, a review. Um, there are abstracts out there from lots of centers who have started to take this on. But most of this, if we're honest, is work in progress. You know, looking at the ELSO registry data, looking at uh, those with transplant who have received ECMO, and they sort of fall into the group that receive it perioptively, and people who maybe receive it for atypical respiratory infections uh, down the line. Um, but there's not a lot, uh, and maybe that's something we need to be looking at as well. What about Kings? How, how did we come into this? Again, very much a view that we would offer ECMO across the block and that the liver population should not be excluded. But we've been doing it for about seven years, so we're a relatively newcomer. Uh, but uh, we are quite a cost-effective service. Uh, we meet most of ELSO's uh, quality control. And we do a very interesting case mix uh, of patients, of whom a third are within the liver population. But equally, they are subdivided between the various ELSO modes um, a third are ECPR for refractory arrest, a third are VA for cardiovascular failure, and a third are respiratory, but only in the, the specialist populations. We still transfer uh, patients with uh, pneumonia uh, out to other centers at times. This is sort of the overall picture, and the, the reason I give you this is really just so that you're clear that, you know, we are used to doing ECMO, uh, and we haven't just jumped into liver ECMO, uh, out of the blue. Um, given that we're a very mixed uh, ECMO program, we're looking at survival uh, to discharge over 50% and fairly good in both uh, the ECPR group where our survival, my, you can probably see my pointer just over the numbers there, about 47% surviving and the majority of them neurologically intact. And then uh, VA uh, and then survival in in VV. And this is mostly the liver group, and these are mostly patients who would not be suitable for transfer to the National Respiratory ECMO centers. And we know from very good data published by uh, our colleagues, uh, we've got excellent outcomes at uh, GSTT, so Guys and St. Thomas's, and also at the Royal Papworth Hospital, that if you are declined respiratory ECMO on the basis of futility, then survival is very poor. And uh, we occasionally do children. We don't do pediatric ECMO, but our hand has been forced on occasion uh, in the liver population and survival there is good. So uh, we've benchmarked ourselves uh, against the SAFE score uh, in uh, the VA cases and against the REST score in VV cases. And, and again, that's important for us taking on a specialist population like liver. And again, we, we are comfortable and even more so, we are very comfortable now that ELSO have taken up benchmarking. And I think that is a brilliant innovation by ELSO and they're to be congratulated on providing uh, mortality reports uh, on the patients. And I think that's something we should encourage in the future because 
it is often by examining the registry data that we can get a real feel as to who might benefit from these sort of interventions when it is so difficult to carry out uh, other studies. So let's get to uh, the meat of the topic uh, while you're all here. So ECMO in a liver intensive care unit. Well, really is what most people say to me. Um, exactly what are we talking about? I, I think people uh, uh, are often surprised um, because liver disease and ICU uh, has, uh, in many institutions, uh, a difficult uh, history where many patients with liver disease were excluded from receiving even intensive care on the basis of their right outcome. But we are talking about all types of, of liver disease. We are talking about acute liver failure. We are talking about uh, chronic liver failure, elective transplantation, emergency transplantation in ALF. We are talking about the liver transplant recipient, and we are talking about people before during and after transplantation. So a very wide range of patients. And I want you all to think very hard about the societal implications of uh, transplant and of the importance to the donors who have given this gift of life to uh, our transplant patients. Uh, and we have to do everything possible to see good that gift of life and that's an important societal message quite aside from uh, the percentages of people who survive and i want you to bear that in mind when you're thinking about this so what, what's about the sorts of etiologies um this is not just hepatopulmonary syndrome which some may think it is this is all etiologies in the acute side we have used ecmo in acute liver failure seronegative in, in subacute liver failure uh, polypharmacy, overdose, paracetamol overdose, liver trauma. Uh, we have a few cases of acute Wilsons who required extracorporeal support. We have uh, successful transplantation for uh, pregnancy-related liver failure, acute hepatitis B, and acute blood carry. And we are really very privileged that we see these interesting cases coming to us. Um, and uh, they are all patients who potentially, if the severity of illness is bad enough, uh, may need more than just conventional intensive care support. And then we have also the chronics, the PSCs, uh, alcoholic liver disease, NASH. Uh, so all, all comers are welcome uh, at our door. These, these are the sort of characteristics. And I think the first thing to point out, so there is a, a non-liver column here. Uh, all liver patients receiving extracorporeal support, and then the acute liver failure patients uh, receiving support. And I just want to point out a few relevant numbers. They are very young. Okay, the median age of our patients, our liver patients receiving ECMO is 37, and for acute liver failure, it is 28. It's a very, very young population, and young people are amazing uh, in terms of what they can get through. They, they are very sick. Uh, the median lactates in this group are 11 or 12, low platelets. Uh, most had a severe transaminitis, and, and this is not a transaminitis uh, of hypoxic origin. This is uh, intrinsic transaminitis related to their liver disease. Most were extremely coagulopathic, and uh, they have very, very jaundiced. Um, it's quite a wide range here from uh, around about the 30 or 40, so child's A perhaps, uh, up to people with a bilirubin of uh, five, six, seven, eight hundred. And they were sick by ICU standards. Uh, the median SOFIN score is sort of uh, approaching 20. Um, many uh, had high Murray scores. Uh, many were post arrest. Uh, a lot had intracranial hypertension, particularly in the acute liver failure group, and pretty much all of them were already on uh, maximum conventional support, high-dose vasopressors, renal replacement therapy. And just to remind you all of this paper from critical care medicine, just looking at mortality, uh, hospital mortality here uh, against SOFA score. Once your SOFA score is up here, well, that is near certain death. And, and that is why I have added to the title for this webinar, because that's really what we're talking about. So these are our outcomes. I, I've tried to break these down on the next few slides because it, I want to give you the whole picture. 
Um, so in, in the liver population, uh, survival to discharge is, is over 50%. And 25 of these patients out of 36 had uh, liver transplants either undertaken on ECMO or uh, they had ECMO after the liver transplant as salvage. And at a year, about 50% of these people are alive and walking around. And I think when one considers that uh, an unplanned ICU admission in the United Kingdom has mortality around about 30%, uh, those are very creditable uh, results, especially when one bears in mind that for those with cardiac ECMO, nearly half were actual ECPR, and for those with respiratory ECMO, uh, nearly half were actually transplanted on ECMO. So it is possible. But it is also very true that there are things that we have learned. And there has been a learning curve here. And maybe there are things not to do. And we'll have a quick look at that. And maybe there are things that we should definitely do. We have had trouble with intraoperative salvage. There are case reports where intraoperative salvage for liver transplantation has been successfully managed with ECMO. But in our three cases, they all died. And I think the conclusion that we have reached during the course of this program is if the liver graft itself is failed, then ECMO will not save you any more than the ventilator or the dialysis circuit. You must have a working liver to survive. So there are some things we've learned not to do. However, uh, there are some we should definitely be supporting. There's no question about it. Out of uh, 30 patients, acutes and chronics, transplants and non-transplants, nearly 60% of these patients, and they include VA, ECPR, VV, survived. And that is a very, very uh, creditable number and compares very favorably. We've been looking with ELSO at survivors in the ELSO database, and less than 25% of patients with a transplant in survived ECMO on the ELSO database. And hopefully we'll be able to bring that to you uh somewhere along the way so you should definitely be going to uh, a liver center so just to, to show you those numbers in slightly bigger format so all liver 47 percent survivors of which 25 were transplant recipients uh, across all modalities uh, the learning curve there probably is a group that cannot be saved by ecmo maybe these are the interoperative group uh, but predominantly if the graft has failed ECMO probably will not help. And there are the group that we certainly should be doing. We should be supporting, irrespective of whether they're acute or chronic, and irrespective of whether they are uh, post-transplant or ALF uh, you know, being bridged to recovery, then there is a role for ECMO here. These are the sort of cases that we've done. And I've, I've, I've got a little table here of some of our VA cases and VV cases, but the yellow delineates the liver ones. So we have got some children post-transplant uh, and pre-transplant. Uh, we have got uh, peripartum lady too sick for transplant. We have got post-transplant cardiogenic shock with ECPR. We have got polypharmacy overdose. We have got a liver transplant who actually underwent cardiac surgery and then uh, could not be weaned off by bypass, survived. And then we've got hepatopulmonary syndrome. So lots of different etiologies, and I think that's the point I'm trying to make. ECMO is just part of our armamentarium for managing the uh, mortally ill. These are our two children. I'll just tell you a little tale about them both. Uh, this is a young girl with originally hepatoblastoma, who had a curative uh, liver transplant, and then the graft failed some years later. And at 11 years, 11 years old, she came to us for emergency transplant, and she could not go anywhere else for ECMO. And we reviewed her, and she spent 26 days on VV ECMO. But she is at home with her family. She has been uh, on trips to Barcelona. She is doing excellently. So, and I think there's no doubt that this young girl would have died without ECMO support. And on the other side of the page, uh, a year later, an 11-year-old boy came to us from Ireland with acute Wilsons, uh, deemed untransplantable, and we transplanted him on ECMO. Uh, he spent eight days with us, and again, he's at home with his family, uh, hoping to get a pet. He's done brilliantly. And we have had a death, 
Um, so ECMO is not a, a panacea, as I'm reminded by some of my colleagues at times, but uh, I don't think these children could have survived without uh, modern intensive care, including ECMO. So th this is the choice that we are faced with, and we need to get over uh, any prejudice we may have about liver disease uh, or about uh, calculation, and we need to choose. Are we going to allow a patient group who face near certain death uh, to uh, say we have reached the end of what we can offer, or are we going to consider offering the MACMO with everything that that entails in terms of manpower resource uh, and sequelae of illness? And I, I think our conclusion at King's is that we are going to offer the MACMO. Uh, but that there are certain groups that we need to be thinking about. So I just want to wrap it up for you um, and uh, say to you that the mortally ill can survive, but they need our help. They need us to believe. And that is true in even the worst subgroups. It is even true with those with liver disease, with acute liver failure, those who are peritransplantation. Uh, even if they are untried. And Certainly, it is true that youth is on their side, but we don't need to be uh, choosing certain death uh, when there is an alternative. And we need to look very, very carefully at what is the role of ECMO in liver disease. And for best outcomes, I would suggest you need to go to a center that does both. So that just leaves me to thank you all very much indeed for attending this webinar. Uh, I hope that that has uh, encouraged you to ask some questions. I'm very happy to ask, uh, to answer questions uh, both now, but also if you want to contact me offline. Uh, here are some uh, pictures of our survivors, um, both children, mothers, uh, adults, post-cardiac surgery, and uh, feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to discuss our, our cases with anybody who would like to. Thank you very much. Robert, thank you so much for your uh, exciting presentation. Uh, I think all of us uh, have uh, learned quite a lot and I hope that uh, your pers perspective uh, helps to sh maybe shift the perspective on how we, how we look at liver patients in the context of um, um, extended life support measurements um, as the, you know, as the data that you have shown are quite impressive. Thank you very much. Um, um, dear participants, please don't forget to put in your questions. Questions are coming in by the minute. And um, we are happy to start the discussion right now. Robert, I, uh, I, I think you've uh, made a very nice point in, in firstly stating that uh, your patients have a quite well, not to say very good long-term outcome. And that due to that reason in principle, uh, big parts of your patient cohorts are uh, in fact good candidates if we think about long-term outcome. Um, the, the first complex of questions I would like to go into is that apart from the eCPR patients, if you maybe firstly look at the VV patients, what would be the, the main indications for ARDS? What, what are the underlying conditions? Is this infection? What, what are these patients troubled with? Yeah, so uh, it, it is a mixed etiology, uh, but part of the problem, I think, particularly in acute liver failure, is that the syndrome of acute liver failure uh, often includes multi-organ failure. Not often it is respiratory in nature. Uh, they're very prone to infection uh, because irrespective of whether you've received immunosuppressive medications, acute liver failure itself, so you know that liver is a crucial part of your immune system. Once you've got acute liver failure, the immune system is basically completely down. And in no time at all, these patients usually have uh, a significant uh, respiratory uh, illnesses, often pneumonia, and often the, in the setting of sort of vasoplegic distributive shock, uh, these patients also are accumulating a huge pulmonary capillary endothelial leak. And I think that's something that's interesting to look at. 
do patients with acute liver failure get a worse pulmonary capillary endothelial leak than other patients, or is this just part of the multi-organ failure syndrome that we're all seeing in so many patients? Uh, so I think that's the main etiology. I mean, they are uh, a very, very sick group. All of the VV patients that we have put on uh, for uh, acute liver failure, or indeed all of them, uh, were people with a Murray score around about the three and a half mark, uh, often with dense consolidation on their uh, chest x-rays, often uh, with significant cumulative fluid balance for their vasoplegic shock. They're often on very high dose vasopressors. And um, I think just like any other respiratory ECMO patient, they deserve the same consideration uh, for extended treatment. Okay, so there are, there's two additional questions uh, sure. uh, on this issue. Uh, you mentioned that for one, these patients seem to have um, pulmonary failure as part of multi-organ failure, and for the other, they are prone to infection. Uh, mentioning the capillary leakage, is there anything that you can recommend to rather non hepatology, gastroenterology, specialized intensivists. Is there anything specific that you do in the treatment of these conditions? Capillary so, leakage. So that, that's a very difficult, that is the magic bullet. Would we not all like to know what is the answer to turning off um, pulmonary capillary leak? I think we would all love to know the answer to that. Uh, what sort of treatment modalities are there for acute liver failure? Um, transplantation is the one that brings the biggest survival benefit by a significant margin. Uh, there is data out there that plasma exchange, so plasmapheresis may be beneficial in acute liver failure, and we do offer that to some of our patients, and you'll see some of the patients in uh, our group uh, have been plasma exchanged as well as being on uh, ECMO, and there does seem to be a survival benefit, at least in the literature, uh, for that, does that modulate the cytokine response in acute liver failure? Maybe it does. Um, how is that uh, affecting the pulmonary axis? I think that is less certain um, because obviously that is very high uh, volumes of plasma and is that in fact deleterious for the pulmonary system? I think that is as yet unknown and there is a um, difference of opinion, I think, even within our own service as to what is the best uh, modality there, but we, we do not have a turn off the pulmonary capillary endothelial leak in acute liver failure. Okay, and the second question with regard to BV patients with ARDS, and, and I understand there are different etiologies, we're talking about ALF and transplant and so on. If you at the start of therapy you don't know what you're dealing with in terms of infection, uh, what would be your uh, preemptive an antibiotic strategy? Is there anything that you would recommend that needs to be covered in any case? Anything you we may not think of in non-liver patients? Yeah, I mean, so root, let, I think one needs to think about which is the particular route we're talking about. So in emergency liver transplantation, they, these patients would all be covered with broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, so tazacin would be the standard. They're also all covered with antifungals. It's very common to get uh, invasive fungal disease uh, in uh, the ultra sick transplant population. And we have certainly noticed a very high instance uh, of aspergillosis within the uh, liver ECMO access. Uh, it, it is probable that, that is just in the setting of supreme sort of immunosuppression from both the liver failure and then also pharmacologically post transplant uh, from uh, the uh, regimes that we have to use for the liver. But nonetheless, it does beg the question uh, are ECMO patients more prone to invasive fungal disease than other patients? And if so, why? And there does appear to be some literature uh, suggesting that other. Uh, ECMO services are also seeing a high instance of, of fungal infection. On the other hand, we're testing for it as well, so is there some bias in there? But so, certainly but you can consider antifungals. Talking of aspergillosis uh, and having a, a patient with a liver disease, so what would be the substance that you feel sort of comfortable with uh, giving to the patient that has an anti-aspergillosis uh, activity? 
Yeah, so I mean, we, we would be comfortable. I mean, we use Andela Funden very regularly, but we be comfortable with Amazon. Uh, I think it's more important to treat the infection uh, than it is to be concerned about the adverse effects on the liver or the liver graft. And it's very common to give these drugs to these patients uh, without significant difficulties. Okay. Whereas uh, rampant, uncontrolled invasive aspergillosis is a fatal disease post transplantation. So treatment is mandatory. Okay. So with respect to the arterial venous patients that you treat, what would be the main indications? Is there anything typical or, or outstanding that, that, that you see in these patients, why they need to go to VA ECMO? Um, so uh, it, it is a, a mixture. Uh, some have had uh, uh, unexpected arrest or uh, a dysrhythmia. Uh, related to the severity of their illness, and they've been supported for VA from that reason. Um, I can certainly think of one case where there was a uh, suspicion uh, that it was all pharmacologically induced. So, uh, from the sort of polypharmacy overdose, we're not just talking obviously they come to us predominantly because they also took a lot of paracetamol, and their liver is down as a result of uh, any, the paracetamol poisoning. But in the polypharmacy overdoses, uh, often uh, they are coming with uh, high severity of illness, high dose vasopressors, dysrhythmias, and I think it is very likely that uh, they have partaken of drugs that also affect cardiac access there. So that's sort of been a reason why we may institute VA in these patients. Okay. Now, um, you did not really mention on the kind of complications that you see and uh, introducing uh, your cohort with a platelet count of around 50. And, and I think a lot of us being um, sort of afraid of um, the coagulation system and acute liver failure. And we have quite a lot of uh, questions on that from, from our participants. Sure, sure. What, so what complications let, do you run into? Uh, so I think there's no doubt about it that let me break this down into a few areas. So first of all, in acute liver failure, uh, although the numbers look awful, uh, so you may have an INR of eight, they're not necessarily bleeding all over the place. And that is because you have a, a loss of both sides of the coagulation pathway. So both the pro and anti-coagulation uh, markers are lost in acute liver failure. And although one is very worried about the idea that they may have an INR of 10, Actually, it does not prove to be a problem clinically at the bedside often. Um, platelets, we support them, so, uh, but we are reasonably conservative. Unless we are actively bleeding, uh, we often do not support them much over 20. And uh, um, certainly a target of 50, I think, would be adequate uh, unless there's a problem, mainly because it's almost impossible to get the platelets up any higher. And I think the blood bank will go nuts if we're aiming targets of 80 or 100, which are impossible to achieve in these patients. So that's the sort of the liver failure side. What, what complications we've seen, having said that they don't bleed much, I mean, if they go to transplant, the, these patients have significant blood loss uh, and require uh, a great deal of coagulation support. And, and that really applies whether they're on ECMO or not. A sick patient going to transplant may often have uh, significant blood loss, and I think our anaesthetic team doing a brilliant job there, and our blood bank sort of supporting these patients. They do have very high transfusion requirements, uh, but often uh, uh, we are not seeing bleeding problems so much related to the ECMO circuit uh, as perhaps we are seeing from the operative uh, side of things. So we run a lot of them heparin free. Uh, we don't give heparin boluses necessary or small heparin boluses to go on. Uh, we support their playlists to go on, but then we're not too aggressive afterwards. Uh, we're using uh, point of care testing, TEG, Rotem uh, to guide us uh, in the calculation. But also, we, I think we are very guided by the clinical uh, features that we are seeing. So, you know, if they are not bleeding, then we tend to take quite a measured view. In in a in a non bleeding patient, Rob, um, would you have any cutoff um, as far as the coagulation is concerned, where you will or will not start heparin? Talk, talking about INA for uh, INR, for example. Yeah, so it is a very individualized case. I think it depends what you think is the etiology of the coagulation disturbance. So uh, in someone who has got a uh, 
prolonged INR, uh, but we feel that this is related to the liver synthetic function or to the graft becoming embedded in the patient, then we probably would not be too concerned uh, and uh, we'd be reasonably happy to start heparin. Many people quote an INR of two, but we certainly have started uh, heparin uh, higher than that, because I think an important thing to consider, especially in the post-transplant group, is uh, hepatic artery thrombosis. So that is a feared complication of liver transplantation and uh, hepatic artery thrombosis. You're either faced with retransplant often, uh, or you're faced with loss of the graft, and we know that to be a disaster. So uh, it is easier for the surgeons to sort out bleeding. Uh, and it is to sort out hepatic artery thrombosis. And I think it, it would depend. So an acute bud chiari uh, with procoagulant condition that is not necessarily revealed by the numbers, we would be much keener to get onto heparin infusion really as soon as possible. Uh, and if there are bleeding problems, then talk to the, our surgical colleagues about it or just, just be patient and let the patient sort themselves out. Uh, for patients without procoagulant disorders, where we know from... Uh, the operative intervention, because we have a very close relationship with, with our surgeons, that they've got a good size past artery, no mismatch, uh, then we might say, well, let's just run the heparin three. We okay. do have guidelines, but a lot of it is very, uh, there are, I think, quite a lot of subtleties. And like a lot of medicine, we are trying to uh, synthesize several things at the same time. Uh, where transplant is concerned. So it's not just about the coagulation pathway, but it's also about, well, what, what was it like putting the liver in? How much bleeding have we had? What's the hepatic artery like? You know, what do we know about the whole of the patient? So trying to separate out uh, the end clinical decision from any particular coagulation or even point of care test, I think is important. You need to take a holistic view to what might be happening at the bedside. Okay, now if, if you're not too worried about bleeding and you go for heparin, do you think any specificities, there are any specificities with regarding to monitoring the heparin effect in these liver patients or do you just run them like regular patients? So, so we don't give boluses uh, usually. Um, we usually start ultra low dose and, and creep it up. Uh, it's not uncommon to start doses around 250 to 500 uh, units per hour. Uh, standard test that we're using is the APTR, and we're targeting an APTR sort of around about the 1.8 to 2.2 mark, but we're very happy to crank that back if we're concerned about uh, an ongoing process, and uh, we are very happy to go up if we're uh, not making the target and there's no evidence of bleeding. But I think we would usually start very, very gently in this patient cohort, uh, when we're quite sure they're settled. And it is a joint decision. I think a lot of care within all of our ICUs is about shared care. So this is a joint decision with our surgical colleagues, uh, talking to them, you know, even, even though they are not uh, specialists in, in ECMO, uh, it is about talking to them. Well, where's the main risk from their point of view? How dry was it at the end of surgery? How far out are we from the operating time? Is this someone we... Uh, transplanted on ECMO, which is quite different from putting on a stable patient three days later with uh, uh, ARDS secondary to pulmonary infection. So it's a different balance. Okay, I, 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 there are two more questions on, on the bleeding sure. issue. Um, I don't know if you specifically address that in your analysis, but w where do these people bleed? This will be the one. Uh, <laughs> Is this like a diffuse thing and they bleed from all holes or do they have a... No, that, that's actually quite unusual. Uh, as I say, we, we are not seeing... They can bleed from the lion sites, but in, in VV that is uh, uh, relatively uncommon, I would say, in our experience. Uh, they are often... There is some bleeding from the abdominal drains at times. Um, uh, we have seen uh, bleeds into the chest. Uh, in the liver group, we have not seen a bleed into the brain. We have put people on ECMO who have had small subdural secondary to intracranial hypertension in the setting of acute liver failure and not seen them extend, um, but does not seem to be as big a problem in this group. Now, whether that is because we have very measured, very cautious heparin strategy, or whether that is partly the pathophysiology of the coagulation disturbance in acute liver failure and periliver transplantation, it's quite hard to unpack. Okay, and if they bleed 
and you think this is not something that a surgeon can fix uh, in an instance. Then you spell the happen. Um, it's you will, the okay, coagulation you support. See, there's no specific thing yet that you would want to do with these patients, just regular management. <laughs> I think regular management, uh, you know, if they're bleeding and it's not felt to be surgical an option, I mean, the first question, and particularly for the VV patients, uh, you know, they, they don't need heparin. Uh, the circuits are extremely good these days, um, yes. and you can run them heparin-free for a very long time. And I think, you know, when we have actually had a few patients uh, in, in whom heparin has been implicated as part of the problem, so we have patients who have developed HIT on ECMO and who we've used Orgatraban for uh, instead. So. Uh, it is very much a case-by-case -case selection. We've got a brilliant hematology department support uh, who we're able to talk to if we're running into sort of complex uh, issues. But I think then what I would recommend for people undertaking this, you just, just go light on the heparin. You don't need a lot of heparin in these patients. And even in some of the VA uh, patients who I'm significantly more nervous about running heparin-free, nonetheless, you only need a little bit. You can always cut the circuit out and put in a new one. Okay. Now, Rob, you've you've mentioned the uh, the problem of elevated intracerebral uh, pressure. Um, do you monitor the pressure non-invasively, or do you have probes in sometimes in the patients? So, uh, within acute liver failure, uh, there has been a, a history of putting in. Uh, yeah, intracranial bolts for measuring the pressure. I have to say that is much, much less common uh, now, and that is because the management of the drivers of intracranial hypertension, uh, I think, are clearer, uh, and the way that we have uh, standardized care, and I give credit to uh, Professor Wendon and George Housinger and my colleague Professor Bernal, you know, who've been so much involved in this work over the last 20 years, uh, we actually find that we are having less deaths. It's very rare now to have a death from intracranial hypertension in, in acute liver failure. They do still occur, but the last death that I can remember uh, where we felt that there was an intracranial hypertension uh, component was actually someone who came to us with HSV hepatitis and fluorid multi-organ failure and sadly died and uh, post-mortem did demonstrate there was in fact also an encephalitis. So uh, we tend not to bolt them. I don't bolt people on ECMO. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, so I wouldn't advocate for that. Uh, but I think standard management for ALF with uh, uh, high volume hemofiltration, control of ammonia, hypotonic saline, uh, sort of the, the protocolized standard of care we would have for people with hyperacute liver failure is usually adequate to control uh, their intracranial hypertension. And you know, we are even transplanting people who have grade four, well, they obviously have grade four hepatic uh, coma, but who have lost their brainstem reflexes with that, and they can go on to make a good recovery. So uh, it would not put me off. Okay, so with this statement, you have uh, answered between four and five questions that came in by participants. Thank like you to, very like much, making my job there. very easy. Um, now, do you see any more things that you think are important in these patients? Any typical complications? Any of the management issues that we have not touched yet in our discussion? So I, th I think the, the chief problems that we have been having in these patients, I would say, are infectious. Uh, the severity of illness is very high, which is why they get onto ECMO. Uh, and I think what we have been seeing is a lot of infections in these patients uh, and uh, attention to detail, both of the environment, um, which is very challenging, um, but also attention to detail about uh, antibiotic stewardship. I can hear my colleagues laughing in the background. Uh, but in particular, identifying when is their treatment failure and how do we identify uh, what is the ongoing problem? Because undoubtedly for those patients that we have lost, uh, sepsis has played an absolutely key role. And particularly where the graph has struggled, uh, then that, that is usually the number one enemy. Okay. So now that you probably, for a lot of us, uh, have contributed to, to change the perspective on liver patients and, and ECMO, um, I, I just will want to make sure that you one more time clearly address the patients that you would not consider you worth talking about the probe. You showed your limited okay. experience with with uh, salvage, uh, intraoperative salvage. Um, the, probably the, the, the most the most liver patients that many of us will see non-specialized ICU will be, let's say, um, patients with uh, 
active alcohol problems with uh, um, advanced liver cirrhosis, uh, maybe going into um, hepaturenal situations. Where would you say don't don't uh, do ECMO in, in these populations? So, so that is a very difficult question. So I think uh, someone who has got acute liver failure or someone who is peri uh, liver transplant uh, is a totally different sort of patient to someone with end stage uh, chronic liver disease. Now ECMO is not a cure, it is a supportive treatment. So the, the question that needs to be addressed for patients such as that is what is the reversibility? Where is their liver disease in its uh, evolution? Uh, and I think for people who have uh, end-stage uh, liver disease for whom there is not a curative option, uh, then it's much more difficult to advocate to put them on ECMO. I'm, I'm certainly not saying never. Uh, and uh, indeed, we do have successes in some of the chronic cirrhotic group, but I, I think they are a group that uh, we need to look at in a lot more detail before deciding that we should be putting all liver patients on ECMO because we are clearly not advocating to put all liver patients on ECMO uh, because I think that would be uh, a very high burden of treatment for a group who may have a poor outcome, but we are certainly advocating to put uh, uh, people on where they have a reversible illness, and particularly they're young. And I think to some extent, you can compare this perhaps with the graft failure group. Uh, if your graft is not working, if the graft is dead, uh, that is an analogous situation to having, uh, you know, end-stage liver disease, a chronic sclerotic condition potentially, and ECMO will not make that better. Uh, so, uh, the group that we have uh, really the most experience with is, is the peritransplant group and the acute liver failure group. And although we have undertaken sort of ACLF decompensated liver disease, uh, it is about making a judgment about how severe is their liver disease, where are they on their liver journey, uh, and is this a, you know is this a first presentation? Are they high functioning? Uh, are they normally child's A? Is this just a blip from which? You know, they can recover, or is this part of uh, what may be terminal evolution of their disease? And that's quite a hard judgment to make. And I appreciate that for people who are uh, coming from this is the sort of patient we see, uh, that that is a, a different patient cohort entirely from the sort of cohort that we've really been talking about here. Okay, thank you, thank you very much on helpful? the very clear statement on, on potential uh, limitations also on liver patients. So Rob, uh, I, I see there's one uh, one last question from our participants, um, and I pass that on to you. Do you have any experience on potential secondary but carry syndromes conferred by the drainage cannulae of the ECMO in uh, orthotopic liver transplant patients? Have you seen so, anything? Like that? So no, we have we have not seen that. It, we have seen we have seen uh, thrombus on the pipes. Uh, but we have not seen secondary uh, bud carry uh, caused by uh, the mechanical uh, circuit. And I think it's an interesting one because one of the things that we're not quite clear about is in fact, uh, to, when you've got a new graft in, the graft needs to uh, thrive. And in a setting of uh, severe multi-organ failure, particularly with high peak airway pressures, uh, the right heart, even if it is functioning well on echocardiogram, may actually be under a lot of pressure. Uh, and that may form a form of functional outflow obstruction uh, to uh, the new graft, which can kill the graft. Uh, and there is potentially uh, a role, and there is some data out there from portio pulmonary hypertension, uh, that if you can modulate that, that that may be beneficial for the incoming graft. So th there is some thinking that uh, the provision of ECMO in people with high right-sided pressures from ARDS or an intrinsic uh, problem may actually benefit from having the liver properly drained by the cannula. So almost the reverse of what you're saying, there is a benefit to it rather than the secondary bud Chiari type problem. Okay, Rob, thank you so much for the lively uh, conversation, for the, for the great discussion. Thank you very much to the participants for joining so actively. Um, I think we all profited very much from your experience, and um, thank you, thank you so much at this point. So, Peter, thank you again, very much for inviting me. It's really been a you pleasure. You are very welcome. Now, 
I would like to remind all of you of an invitation that you may have received uh, uh, during the day by email. We are looking uh, forward to have the URLZO Congress, uh, the annual Congress meeting 2020 in London, actually, between May 6 and May 8. Rob, it would be lovely to see you there again. It's a home game, so to say. And uh, for our participants and for the URLZO community, please uh, write that down in your, in your schedule, in your calendars, and make sure that you can make it. We have a, a large number of uh, renowned speakers from all over the world sharing their experience and, and really there to, to help you and to prove uh, all of our actions. And, and, and um, it, it's going to be really exciting. So please make sure to come there. So thank you very much to all of you again. Eventually, uh, here's our two final reminders as always. For one, you're only safe if your Venus line is blueberry and your arterial line is cherryberry. And for the other, don't ever forget breathing. Other way, it may cost you life. This is Peter Shalangowski on behalf of Eurelso from Vienna, Austria. Thank you very much for joining today and have a great evening, morning, wherever you join from. Goodbye. Thank you.